You're listening to The Back 40, the podcast for Ontario farmers, covering topics and issues that matter most to Ontario agriculture. Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm the host of The Back 40, Mike Bryan, agribusiness specialist at Trillium Mutual Insurance. During the pandemic, there's a lot of people that are selling produce in particular that have had to go online when farmers markets, certainly initially in the pandemic, farmers markets were not going to be operating. And so the choice was made that they would sell much of their produce online and try to still access those same customers. We all kind of think of that as fairly straightforward. You just go online, but there's a great deal more to it than that. And nobody does that all by themselves. You have to get the right platform and the right people helping you. The company that is helping farmers with that is Local Line. We are talking today with Cole Jones of Local Line. Cole, welcome to the Back 40. Thanks for having me. So tell our listeners, what is Local Line? Local Line is an e commerce platform for the local food industry. We help small family farms that sell all kinds of products, list their products online, and digitize their order fulfillment processes. So if you're a produce farm or a livestock farm and you're selling to households or you're selling wholesale like to restaurants or grocery stores, Local Line is the system that you would use to power those orders, to manage your inventory, your deliveries, your payments, all of the things that come with being able to sell online and sell direct to a customer. So we're going to talk in a few minutes about what all is involved in this. But before we get going there, how did you get started in this? This was somewhat by accident, I think, as maybe most of these things are. I was doing my undergrad at Wilfrid Laurier University in the philosophy program, became very interested in food systems. I ended up speaking and meeting a lot of farmers in and around the St. Jacobs area who had these direct market farms. Most of the time, they were selling through farmer's markets. As it turns out, farmer's markets most of the time are not very profitable for the farmer. And so the origins of our company were kind of just becoming friends with a lot of these Mennonite farmers in St. Jacobs and just trying to think, is there a better model? What would it look like to have a more profitable way to sell those products? And ultimately, it snowballed into the system that we have today. If you walk through the farmer's market at St. Jacobs in the summertime and in the fall, you see there's a tremendous amount of produce there, a tremendous number of products, and you think that's got to be hugely profitable. But there's a lot involved with getting that produce there and then taking it home again if you don't get it sold. That's the thing, right? It's not to say that they are unprofitable. It's more just that they're a little bit of a necessary evil in a lot of cases for these farmers because it's kind of the only outlet that they have where they can go find customers to buy the products. You're completely correct. I mean, on market day, you're up super early, you're loading the van with products, you get to the market, you sell what you sell, you end up bringing some home or trying to give it away. You've lost a full day of productivity on farm. And the reality is by the time that you factor in a lot of those costs, it can be an okay way to get by And there's always the top 1%, you know, vendors that can make it work. But on mass, it's probably not the best infrastructure to have if you want to have a really strong local food system. And so for us, we thought that we should build a 21st century version of that, so to speak, which opens a lot more doors, in our opinion, for farmers that want to sell in different ways to different kinds of people. So when did you get started on this? We started the company in late 2015. At the time, it started as a marketplace, interestingly, for farmers and chefs. If the farmer's market maybe wasn't the answer, I wonder if you could make it easier for chefs to procure local food. That was how the company originally started. And that business worked at a small level. What became obvious was that if your goal was to help as many farmers as possible, which ours was, it would be pretty difficult to scale 
that business out and be able to really build a marketplace in that way that could help a lot of farmers. So we pivoted the business and focused more on just building software to help the farmer do their job better when they sell to their customers, as opposed to us trying to middleman it. Yeah, it's a lot better to help them sell to the people that they need to sell to. And and you're right, that's a pretty limited market when you start talking about chefs. You really want to sell to the rest of us here. Now you talk about helping them manage that. And on the surface, this is a platform that you can sell on, but there's so much more to it than that. Talk to us a little bit about things like inventory control and other things that are in behind that many of us don't consider when we think about e-commerce. You're completely correct. Even sometimes I don't like the word e-commerce, even just for our business, because it does convey this very tip of the iceberg type of situation for us. There's two main components to our platform. Number one is how the farm accepts the order. So that is the e-commerce storefront. But the second part, which is arguably much more important, is what happens after they get an order. They have to pick the product. They have to pack it. They have to load it, ship it, invoice it, and get paid. So there's six steps in a life cycle of every order times however many orders that you have. And if you don't have a system that is custom built for the workflows that a farm goes through, you are uh, asking for headaches in most cases. And that's what Local Line is particularly good at, is taking all of your orders and saying, here's your aggregate pick list. Here's your pack list. Here's your delivery routes. Here's your minimum orders. We ensure you're profitable on every order that you get. Here's your invoicing, your payment terms. We integrate with your accounting system. So it really is the system of record for orders, for inventory, for customers. It's kind of the nucleus where your information lives on the farm. No more packing a truck full of stuff, taking it to the market and hoping that you get rid of most of it by the time you get home. (laughs) That's exactly the idea, right? Instead, the difference is you pre-sold all of your products for pickup at the market. So now whatever you're bringing to the market, you already know is sold. So this is totally customizable to whatever the needs are of the particular farmer that is hoping to use it. I mean, our team spent a lot of time thinking about that. It was really important for us that you don't come out of the gate too hot and pick the wrong features. For different kinds of farmers, there was a lot of research and time and frankly, relationship building that went into building a platform that can work just as well for beef farmer as it does for produce, as it does for cheese reseller or beverages or a baker. Local line is built for anybody that is selling local food, whether they're selling it because they produce it or they're reselling it. That's what I mean when it's a platform for the supply chain. You can be a wholesaler and use it or a distributor or a buyer or a seller. It takes time to just get to know the specific ins and outs of those businesses and build a system that works for everybody. So there's a lot of businesses, particularly in the last couple of years that have gone online, mostly because they've been forced to. And that anything from clothing to electronics to everything, what makes this one different from something that a regular storefront might use? The core difference is that Local Line is built for perishables, and most of the other e-commerce applications are built for wearables, I guess is the right way to say it. Anybody who works in the food industry knows how different that it really is from selling a t-shirt online. The way that you think about harvests and the way you think about planting and the way you think about expiry and temperature and minimum orders and order lead time, food is like temperature sensitive, low margin business historically. And so what's super important is that you've got the right workflow and it can be really efficient for you. So on a per order basis, you're profitable. I think that can be problematic if you're using a system that wasn't built for a perishable supply chain. Yeah, there's quite a difference between picking a cucumber and hoping to get it sold and getting a t-shirt brought in from China and it's sitting somewhere off the West Coast in a container. Sooner or later, it's going to get here. You do the same thing to a cucumber and it isn't going to matter if it gets here. That's the whole thing, right? And so there's certain characteristics that supply chain has that we've spent a lot of time making sure that we build features that support the specific workings of the food supply chain. Now, you've been quite successful with this in a matter of uh, since 2017. How many customers do you have now and where are they located? We have customers all across North America. We've got about 12,500 farms that are on our platform now in every province and in every state of North America. We'll be expanding internationally in the new year to the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Our team is is really excited about that. 
farming, as we all know, is a tight knit community. And so our company does tend to grow mostly through word of mouth, where a farmer in area will use it and enjoy it and tell their neighbors, which turns into more farmers in other areas using it. We tend to be very dense in Ontario, of course, where the company started. We're very dense in BC, pretty dense in Nova Scotia. California, Michigan, New York. So you, you tend to get pockets, but there's farmers across the continent that are using the software. That also coincides a lot with the areas that do produce a lot of produce. Like if you talk about BC and Ontario, certainly those are areas that produce a lot of produce at this point in time, whereas someplace like Alberta, for example, it's, it's not as common. So this is more than just on farm, though. You also have applications for farmers markets and what you call hubs. Talk to us a little bit about that. This is one of the other things that's unique about the food system is that food tends to get aggregated as it moves through the supply chain. It tends to change hands as it makes its way to the end consumer. And so we thought that it was really important to make sure that we were building a platform that worked for all of the participants of a local food system. And for us, that meant people like farmers markets, that meant people like wholesalers and food hubs and distributors that buy local food from many farms and then typically repackage it, turn around and sell it. So yeah, we've got three core offerings for those core groups. We have for farmers, we have for food hubs and wholesalers like the middleman and then we have for farmers markets and what we've seen most recently is a lot of online co-ops where neighboring farmers will actually come together and almost start their own online grocery store just using local line because they can all pool their products together and sell them online yeah, instead of just getting peppers in one place and tomatoes in another and onions in another, you know, one place and you can pick up everything all right there. You know, you can certainly have your own standalone storefront, but what that does mean is that your customer is probably eating more in their diet than just your produce, right? So now they have to go and find their meats and their cheeses and starches and other things that they're eating. But if you've got neighboring farms with a couple clicks of a button in your local line account, you can actually build an online grocery store and you can pair up the inventory lists of your neighbors. And now the customer gets a one-stop shop for everything that you know they might actually need. And from there, it's a simple matter of either pickup points or delivery schedules or things along that lines. That is correct. Localine as a company will find ways to be more helpful in this area in the future. Today, this largely fits the farm's existing distribution schedule. So if they happen to find themselves in, you know, London or in Kitchener on Mondays and Thursdays, and this is the, they have an order lead time and an order minimum. All of those variables are filtered through for the customer at checkout. And so we help them basically pool inventory and ship it. And we've got some ideas. We think we could do even more than that in the future. So what does the software for the farmer's market look like here? And what does it do? We've got uh, the food hub, I understand, where you're getting the food all come into a grocery store type operation there. Farmers markets are a little different. What's the software like there? It's really literally a, an online farmer's market. So a farmer's market is effectively like a co-op. They're an organizer. So mm -hmm. they organize a space for multiple buyers and multiple sellers to do direct business with each other. Their role is to bring them together, not to be the facilitator of all of those transactions. They're not like a wholesaler sitting in the middle. And so you can imagine in their local line account, they are the organizer. It's like they're organizing a party. Right. They can add any of their farms or vendors that they'd like. They can find new ones on local line. And then they get all of the same marketing and sales features that a farm would have on their account so that they can promote it to their customers. So typically this is done on social media, they put up the storefront on their website, they do newsletters, all of the normal things that one would do to go and let them know that they've got this online market. So if you're a customer, you get to the storefront, and instead of just seeing produce from one farm, you can see lots of products from lots of different farms, and you can filter by category or by farm and a whole bunch of other things and build a aggregate cart like you would a shopping list almost if you were walking through the grocery store and place an order. 
it's an interesting concept. Of course, a lot of us don't think of that. We just like to either go to the farmer's market or go online and click and we can figure out where we pick it up. It's the other stuff in behind. There's got to have been some growing pains on this though. What sort of things did you not anticipate being problems? <laughs> God, how much time do you have? I mean, a lot, probably more than I'd like to admit. I think I mentioned maybe the first part that was uh, challenging for us to get right was to figure out the specific nuances between how somebody like a meat farmer would use local line compared to how somebody like a produce farmer or a wholesaler would use local line. COVID was the other one for us. COVID for our business was overall a positive. We grew very quickly. There are a lot more farmers that know who we are, which is great. Six weeks into the first lockdown, the traffic to our platform was up uh, 4,300%. We were prepared for like two or 300%. We thought we were prepared and being diligent and smart and wise, and but it just kind of went bananas for a while. Overall, that experience went, went really well, but we learned a lot about our platform and made a lot of really important improvements this year to just making it even more scalable and even better. There's quite a difference there to a product that you've got off the shelf. You think this is something that would be relatively easy, but you're talking about customizing this for everybody that comes as a customer there. I'm thinking that you had a lot of people spending a lot of time trying to make this all work. We don't literally customize the system for every new farms on it, but there was a lot of synthesizing data and information where all of these farms tell you the things they want. It always tends to be the vocal minority that's the loudest. So you think, oh, you must go build these things, but maybe that's not right. And so you just have to do a lot of like digging and a lot of data analysis to understand, okay, these are the core things that matter. And then here's how we can build it such that it's flexible enough to support these different use cases. We did our best to make it easy. And certainly it is easy. A farm can go and start a free trial today and they can add their products and, and be selling online. And our team is there to support them. I think for us, it was more just that we had about 5,700 farmers sign up in the first 90 days of that lockdown. That was a lot at one time. It wasn't so much that it couldn't be done. It was just a little bit of overload in that particular moment. Do you like what you're hearing from the Back 40? We'd like to hear from you. Send us an email with your comments and thoughts to theback40 at trillionmutual.com or follow us on social media at Trillium Mutual. How have sales continued? Obviously, they're not the same as they were the first three months. I'm thinking that they'd still be pretty good there. There'd be a lot of companies that have decided that this is a way to go. It's been proven by a lot of people that you can be quite successful with this. Subscription sales for our company have remained strong. We look at it in the three buckets of customers that we serve. They've retained at different rates. The farmer and food hub uh, retention rates have been very strong. Farmers markets have been less strong. They've been more keen, some of them, to go back to that in person, which we can understand. We've always been known for our customer service, but particularly post-COVID, we walked away being known as the best customer service team in our space out of our competitors. So that's really important to us, and it's really important that we continue to play that role I don't know of a farmer that I've spoken with that wants just like another software vendor. They want to feel like they've got somebody that understands their business, that's thinking very thoughtfully about the features that they're going to need six months from now before they're thinking about them. And that when they pick up the phone and have a question that we're going to answer. Considering the industry that you're in and how all of that works, farmers markets and direct sales to farmers is a personal thing. It's about getting to know the people that are selling the product to you and understanding their business as well as them knowing you when you walk in. And it's not surprising that those people want then value that service. But as a company grows, that's maybe the hardest thing to keep. It's easy to do when you're small. It's really hard to do as you grow. So I'm, I'm guessing that that's been a challenge And kudos to you for managing to maintain that level. It is a balance. You're completely correct. I think that for our team, it comes down to, and for any team, it just comes down to a matter of priority. You know, if it is important to you, then you're going to find a way to make those investments and make sure that you keep a certain standard of service. If it's not as important to you, then, you know, maybe it slips a little bit. You know, the reality for us, the way that I think about it as a business person is that, uh, Every happy experience that we can invest in with a farmer, there's a greater likelihood that they refer other farmers to us. On the one side, you can think of your customer service as a bit of a cost bucket. In our business, I think that it's a big revenue generator. It does a lot of marketing for us if we just help farms do good work and help them be successful. 
Uh, from a philosophy standpoint, too often we look at it as a cost of doing business rather than it's really part of the product. It's part of, as you say, what sells. It's part of what brings new customers in. It's part of what keeps people there. And the last thing you want to be is the cheapest on the market and, and following through and saying, oh, well, all it is is price. It's got to, there's got to be that service component to it as well. It's much easier to invest in that level of service when you actually enjoy building relationships with the people on the other end of the phone. So from a personal standpoint, this is obviously more than just a job to you. Why is this your passion? Why are you so driven by this uh, business model that you've come up with? I just don't really like where the future of food is headed without a platform like this that can digitize and then unify all of the small family farms out there. I think that's probably the only way that the food system gets a fighting chance. Otherwise, we're going to wake up and all of our meat will be lab grown and show up in like a tuna can or something like that. I don't know. It just doesn't feel that inspiring to me. There's a tremendous amount of downstream secondary benefits to the world. If you can help family farmers secure their future as independent entrepreneurs, I think there's a lot of good that can come for the environment, a lot of good that can come for people's health when they're eating better foods. I think a lot of good that comes for rural economies and for jobs and community. I just think it's a really worthy cause. I think that farmers are really good people. It's interesting you mention that because a lot of the grocery stores are controlled by large corporations and you walk in there and I know in several that, that I frequent, you walk in and there's a couple of tables of in-season local produce and that's it. And the rest of it all comes from wherever they get it from, wherever they can get it. They're looking for large operators to bring them that food. And I think you're right. I think there's people want that local connection. Certainly uh, the farmer's market in St. Mary's where I go is busy every Saturday when you go into it. I don't blame the grocery stores or the big distributors. Nobody's doing anything wrong. And I always want to be careful. I don't like it when people say the food system is fundamentally broken. For the most part, it does an incredible job. So let's just like give credit where credit's due. There's Absolutely. nothing. But uh, I do believe it's a pendulum. I do believe that we should, you know, intensely try to solve today's problems in the food system. And to me, I think that the best thing that we could do is leverage technology to try to make local food as accessible as, as anything else that you're going to go find. Even the, the whole idea in general of globalization and of economies of scale, the bigger, the better. I think a lot of that had an opportunity to be revisited during COVID anyways, and we maybe mm -hmm. did learn for the first time that centralizing everything is maybe not the smartest way to build things. There's been a few um, problems with that, yes. And so this is like a good thing to just talk about, and if we all believe that we want better food and better economies and healthier people and healthier environment, what are we waiting for then, right? I think that's what our company is ultimately trying to do, is if you can get enough farmers on this platform, there's just a lot of positives to the world. And there's a lot of people out there that, from a consumer standpoint, are thinking along the same lines there, that particularly during the pandemic, I've talked to a fair number of farmers that have said their business has never been better. This has really driven a lot of what they can sell because people are looking for those local farmers. I told on March 14th, I walked into our grocery store here and for the first time in my life, there were empty shelves. And I think people were affected by that. I think people were saying, you know what, maybe we should be looking locally to find people that will supply us. Yeah, I think so. And that's just really hard to do if all of the farms that are out there are running their businesses on like sticky notes and spreadsheets and not actually accessible. I do think that there's a really important need to almost view Localine as a utility, as an application that can get source data collection from the farm that gives everybody an opportunity to see what's available and who has it. I think that there's even just a lot of good that can come from something like that. Oh, we've seen it in other products, right? Like there's a lot of other, you talk about the idea that you can go online and find this stuff. Why not food? Everything else is available. Why not food? Food is actually the least digitized industry in the world. Very oh, I believe that. Enough. I, I this believe is according that. to McKinsey. McKinsey does these studies. I think it's every four years and they rank agriculture as the least digitized industry in the world. Those are kind of like, I guess, the final frontiers. I don't know if that's what you want to call it, right? Of, uh, of digitization. I hope we get to play a small part. 
we talk about where the future goes, where's the future going for local line? What have you got coming down the pipe? I think about two things a fair bit these days. I think about what we can do to help farmers outside of just building software. It does seem to be the case that there's a lot more that goes into running a successful farm outside of just the right software for your farm. And so I am trying to spend my time to think about what are the other core buckets, but I'm just starting to think about, you know, what does local line look like five years from now as a suite of services, not just as an e-commerce storefront. The other thing that I mentioned earlier that our team is really excited about is the internationalization. For the last couple of years, we get farmers most days that chat into our website from around the world wanting to sign up and use local line. And we unfortunately have to put them on our wait list and, you know, keep in touch with them and let them know when we're available. But we've been rebuilding some parts of our application over the year. And part of a launch in January is going to be opening up the platform to a few other places in the world. So just personally, I get really excited about trying to help farmers across the world. It's just to have the opportunity to go and help farmers in other places. If it works here, there's no reason it shouldn't work elsewhere. And if you have the solution, you might as well be the one to provide it. It's such a dangerous assumption, but I agree with you. I agree. I don't know. I feel like, you know, everything that we hear from these farms in in England or in Ireland or Scotland or wherever is like, yeah, like it's the same thing. So, yeah, we, we hope that it transfers well. Well, we'll have to talk to you again after you've had a chance to run that for a little while and see how successful you've been. I'd love that. We've been talking to Cole Jones, CEO of Local Line on the Back 40. Join us in two weeks when our guest will be Martin Pochtaruk, and we'll be talking about solar panels and greenhouses and how one company is harvesting both crops and electricity from the same area. That's in two weeks on the Back 40. You've been listening to the Back 40. Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance. Be sure to subscribe to The Back 40 wherever you find your favorite podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. The Back 40, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm Mike Brine. Until next time, take care and stay safe.